I wear many hats. I'm a conductor of an orchestra. I'm an executive coach. And I also take the occasional gig to be a documentary host. But no matter what hat I wear in life and work, there's always one thing that I need in all these roles. It's a skill I'm pretty sure you need as well. And that's the topic of this episode of Nudge. We've all been there, trying to get a co-worker to see things your way, get a raise from your boss. Persuasion is probably the one skill that we all desperately need. Yet in our quest for this elusive skill, my producers have asked me to turn up here. <laughs> my date for comedy night is neuroscientist Gemma Culvert. She's a pioneer in the emerging field of neuromarketing. Surely there is more to this date than just fun and laughter. So Gemma, why am I here at the comedy club tonight? Don't you feel your mood suddenly shifts into, you know, like, you're much more happy, yeah. much kind of more open? Is it changing my mind in anything? When you're trying to persuade somebody, and maybe they hold contradictory views, it's a kind of a threatening scenario, right? One of the things that happens when you hear a contrary view is that you can suffer from what's called amygdala hijack. OK, that sounds serious. <laughs> your shackles are up, you're ready to defend yourself. And that puts but us in a kind of frame of mind which is not open to right. other suggestions. So Things like oxytocin, the trust no. hormone, is released with humour. So by replacing cortisol, which is associated with amygdala, hijack with feel-good hormones like endorphins and dopamine and oxytocin, you basically change the environment to a much more open and uh, integrative one. You can now start to build a trusting relationship with the other person and start to empathise. You never forget the first time. And then I suddenly see that actually this is something I can relate to. There's a real lowering of defences and you can accept a, a contrary view. It's fascinating to know that humour prepares the ground for when we're trying to persuade someone and that there's a scientific explanation for how that works. But once we've laid the groundwork, how best can we present our case to persuade people to see it our way? That's where Sheila comes in. She coaches corporate leaders on storytelling and influence, charging 600 Sing dollars per person just for a one-day workshop. But she's agreed to coach me for free. Hi, Sheila. Hello. How are you? Often it's an instinct to use facts to try and change someone else's mind. Is that useful? It's not a useful instinct because facts cannot change people's minds. Actually, because of our confirmation bias, once we believe something and we are given facts to the opposite, we believe what we first believed even more. So that's not going to work. So you actually have to fly under the radar with a story. Weave those facts into a narrative. Let me show you something that will help you understand how stories work on us. Interesting. Wow. OK, now tell me how you experience that in your brain. At the beginning, I thought, oh, OK, the big triangle is, is nice and just trying to protect the little triangle from the ball. Then it became insidious. And then the ball tried to escape, and I think the little triangle helped. And then they escaped, and they locked the big triangle in, in the thing. The big triangle gets angry and smashes through the door and smashes the house <laughs> down. So it's quite an insidious tale for me. This is actually a classic psychological experiment called the Haida Simmel experiment, which was done in, in the 1940s. 117 uh, subjects they showed it to. 114 of them described a story. They see characters, whether it's a triangle or a circle, they, they ascribe motives. You're given a, a fact here and a fact there. Our brain wants to join them up. 
into a narrative because that's the way we think. We cannot help but being sucked into a story. And when we hear a story with emotions, we empathize, we connect. But what people don't realize is that all our decisions have an emotional basis. Have you ever wondered why the US has such a big problem with anti-vaxxers? I'm assuming it's like misinformation, <laughs> <laughs> propaganda. Let me play you a clip of Dr. Ben Carson, who was a presidential candidate in 2015. And this is from one of the debates, and he's a doctor, medical doctor. See what he says about vaccines. There have been numerous studies, and they have not demonstrated uh, that there's any correlation between vaccinations and autism. Vaccines are very important, certain ones, the ones that would prevent death or crippling. Now I want you to listen to Donald Trump uh, coming back to Ben Carson in that same debate. You take this little beautiful baby and you pump. I mean, it looks just like it's meant for a horse, not for a child. And we've had so many instances, two years old, a child, a beautiful child, went to have the vaccine and came back and a week later got a tremendous fever, got very, very sick, now is autistic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Donald Trump is putting this image of a beautiful baby that's going not to be well. Yeah. If you do this thing. Yeah. And then the, the, the horse size. Yes. <laughs> yes, of course, yes. It's yeah. like it's not a little needle, it's like this massive yeah. injection, which that I'm sure is it isn't. Obviously not true. Right. But people buy into emotions. They buy into stories. Ben Carson used facts. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump, sadly, is good at stories. Is there a science behind this potential for stories to persuade others? Interestingly. The science that came out in about 2012, 2013, came out of DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the American Military Science Agency. And basically, they wanted to weaponize storytelling. So they took all these subjects, and they, they had a 24-channel EEG lab. They, they tested them for all the different hormones, their breathing rate. The researchers had the subjects listen to different versions of a story. Each time a key story element was changed. For instance, the main character's motivation, the severity of the conflict, or whether the story had a positive or negative ending. We found the elements that make a story have potential for influence. So you make your main character as like your audience as possible because they will empathize, they will see themselves in you. There also has to be risk and danger involved. That gets people hooked into the story. The ending emotion is important. Stories that end badly drive people to action. That's why charities don't tell you about this, you know, this little girl who's so happy now. They tell you about how she's starving and the bad ending and people put their hands in their pockets. Positive endings can also have an effect on beliefs and attitudes, but it tended to be in the longer term. So stories of all kinds get us to consider what we would do in situations we may never have experienced. Facts that are woven into stories become relevant to us, and over time they can help change our beliefs and attitudes. But are there quicker ways to nudge someone into action? I'm hungry this morning, not for food, but to learn some simple tips and tricks that will help me nudge others to see things my way. So Darren, what are we doing here today? We are here today at the food centre to use some of the persuasive nudges to see if we can get extra servings of food. Wow, OK, so why is this a good example of persuasive nudging? Because for the persuasive nudging, we can use it not just on special occasions, but we can do it on a daily basis as well. OK, I can't wait to see what happens and what food you get us. OK, I'll do my best. <laughs> I think Darren is uh, scouting his targets, ready to use his persuasive nudges. 
Darren Tay is the 2016 Toastmasters World Champion. That's an international public speaking competition. He's showing me how he's going to nudge hawkers to give him extra servings for free. Oh, that is OK. Oh, there is Acha, right? Yes, there is Acha. I like Acha. You make Acha yourself? Yes, Acha is your own. Okay, I like Acha. Do you like Acha? Yes, thank you. Can you give me a little bit more, Acha? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to eat Lu Ya. No, we're going to eat three days. OK， 那那那那我要我要 try 了。哇，你们这边还出现了很多在媒体上面的报道哈。哦哦，我看应该应该很，因为是很特别。哦，你们你们的粉丝也应该蛮多的。好，或者是你要你要来个菜，我们有不同菜豆芽，或者是梅菜都有。我我喜欢梅菜，好，我拿一个梅菜，可以可以可以。哇，谢谢你。梅菜可以给我多一点点吗？可以，谢谢你啊，谢谢，神秘金龙啊 ，Thank you， 谢谢。So how successful were you? Like the one in front of you, I got some extra servings of acha, almost double oh, the extra. serving. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And for the second stall, I managed to get extra portion of the preserved vegetable. So it's almost double the portion that you otherwise usually get. It's a very big portion, I noticed, <laughs> yeah. right? So pretty successful, I'd say. What persuasive nudges did you use? For this particular stall, I used a technique rapport building, yeah, showing a genuine interest. Darren built rapport with the food seller by emphasizing their shared love for Acha. For the second stall, we had a couple of coverage from uh, several food review centers. So I used that as well to um, strike a conversation. Apart from building rapport, Darren also framed himself as a potential fan, someone the owner might want to impress. So it sounds like a certain amount of psychology is involved in what you do. Yes, some of which is also grounded in practice. For example, there are a couple of persuasion scholarship talking about reframing. Uh, one popular one is by uh, Robert Cialdini. Basically, they wanted people to part with their email addresses so that they can get a free sample drink. Okay. Yeah. So in the control group, they did no reframing. They just asked, hey, would you want to give me your email address? So just, just like that, yeah. give me your email address. So as expected, the result turned out only 33% of the people gave. But for the other group, he did a bit of reframing at the start. So he said, that, hey, would you say that you're someone who is adventurous to try something new? So most of the people would think, yeah, I'm someone who would like to try new things. Yeah, so later when I ask, hey, would you like to try giving me your email address ah. to try something new? So that helped prime them to say yes. And the result was a staggering, I think, 75.7. That's very a ready. lot more. So that's powerful. People may be nudged to act if they think a choice they're making is in line with how they view themselves. And nudging people to act and do the right thing is something authorities around the world have been trying to do. From eating healthier, to exercising more, to being civic-minded. Yet in Singapore, despite years of campaigning and signages all over, problem areas remain. And there are even signs that we are backsliding in some ways. In 2022, for example, we saw a 50% jump in the number of people caught littering compared to 2021. Can our public campaigns borrow a thing or two from the emerging science of nudging? I'm here to meet an expert on altruistic behaviour to see if a few words on a sign can help nudge us into changing our behaviours. So of these two messages, which one would you choose? Which one would you think works better? The first one says, help save the environment. So I'm saving the environment. So it's appealing to my better nature, basically. Exactly. OK, so now right. this one says, join your fellow guests in helping to save the environment. Right, this is appealing to the, the concept of a social norm, right? The vast majority of other people, 75%, are recycling their towels. Would you want to do, do I, this Do I want well? to join in? Generally, the evidence shows that the social norms works better. How much better? Well, in a study, the social norm message produced a towel reuse rate of 48%, compared to 38% for the environmental protection message. Social norm is often a very powerful motivator. It's also been used in other domains, encourage blood donations, um, charitable donations, and so on. In one study that we did in Singapore, in collaboration with the NEA, this one is sort of the classic appeal to your better tell angels, yourself tell yourself not to leave your rubbish right. behind. In this treatment, now we thought, no, 
what if maybe there are no better angels to appeal to? You know, you see here. So they're you know, leaving rubbish behind. They're leaving rubbish behind, and then the auntie. Oh, there's points, an auntie. Yes, she points to so the rubbish bin. You, Even if you don't really care about keeping the the estate clean, you may not like being called out for it. And which one was 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 more successful? Right. This one works significantly better at reducing cigarette litter. So, so the anti telling me to put the rubbish away works better. That's right. Someone calling you out works very well, in particular for norm violating uh, littering. I have some signs here to encourage people to give up your seat. So, how can I improve on no. this one? Instead of saying, may I have a seat, please, I would just add somewhere the message the vast majority of Singaporeans supports giving up your seat. Picture yourself <laughs> yes. in the carriage. Everybody no. else thinks you should be giving up your seat. I think I'd be shamed if I, if I didn't do it. I yeah. feel bad. So Lawrence is suggesting we use social norms in our signages to nudge people to give up their seats to those in need. I'm curious to see if that tip really works in real life. Time to put it to the test. Public trains in Singapore have clearly labelled priority seating for those in need especially the elderly or pregnant women. But there is another group of people who need a seat that are often ignored. Yan Jiao suffers from a largely invisible condition. She has endometriosis, a painful condition where the lining of the womb grows outside of the womb. It just caused very, very severe pain that radiates down my legs and I would find it pretty difficult to walk with that kind of pain flare. After years of living with this condition, I can hide it like pretty well, so people don't see it, unfortunately. So when you have a flare-up in your pain, do you actually ask for a seat? Oh, uh, no. I'm honestly quite scared that I will get scolded for asking for seats at this age because I look very young and healthy. A 2020 initiative tried to bridge that gap for people like Yan Jiao by issuing special stickers to show that they truly deserve help. Later, a tag was introduced. I've honestly tried using such a sticker on the back of my phone, but uh, like, unfortunately people ignored me. And then when they came up with the tag, I tried again and I got ignored again. So after a while, I just didn't use it anymore. Maybe printing a new tag will help. So here is the tweaked version of the seat tag with the added line, most Singaporeans support giving up their seat. Now we're going to give this to Yen Jiao, who over the next week is going to try it on her way to work and school. Social norms in public messaging work because we feel nudged to conform to what others expect of us. But what if we want to nudge someone for purely selfish reasons? I'm here to meet nudge consultant Richard Bordenave, who asks one of our crew members to be a volunteer for a demonstration. So, hello Jason, hello Tricia. Today we're going to play a little game and you, Jason, will become the investor. So, out of this money, you can decide to give her the amount you want. Whatever you give her, I will multiply by four. You can either keep everything for you or choose to give some of the money that you have. Okay, so I'm going to fund this money. I will give this lady five dollars. Five dollars. I'm going to give her five dollars. So, because I'm the multiplier, I will transform this five into twenty. I got this money based on not doing much, so I would just give him half of what I've earned. Then he can also benefit. Okay, how do you feel? I don't feel too bad, to be honest with you, Richard. I feel quite nice. What is the trust game meant to show? If we were like purely rational people um, moved by self-interest, like, like the economist would tell you, right. she could actually decide not to give back anything and to keep everything. Oh. 
But this uh, game shows that people actually tend to reciprocate and that it's something hardly wired in, in our natural behaviors. Even if we are strangers, most people would actually give back around like 50%. It's sort of a bet. A bet on kindness. It's sort of a social norm. Caldini, one of the researchers who uh, studied power of uh, influence, has actually named reciprocity as one of the top six uh, drivers. So reciprocity is something you can uh, use to nudge people uh, to do whatever you would like them to do by starting yourself, uh, offering them something. So for example, um, if you're a charity and you want people to donate, um, it's often if you open the envelope, you would find a little present to uh, create a feeling of reciprocity because you, you give something first and then you ask for the money. It would be the same if you go to the restaurant and Cialdini has actually studied the influence of uh, offering a, a small gift like a cookie or something um, with the bill. It actually increases the tip. So we can nudge others to do as we wish by putting them in our debt first. But what if we take out reciprocity and just rely on social norms? That's what we asked Yan Jiao to test for in the past week, with a seat tag that reminds readers of social norms. So I was travelling during peak hours and the bus was really crowded. After a while, a lady looked up and she saw the tag and she gave up her seat to me. So thank you to that lady. It's my first time trying out the tag and it worked surprisingly. Hello, so it's my second time trying out the tag today and I tried it out on the MRT when one lady looked up and she saw me with the tag but unfortunately she stared at me for a while and then she continued using her phone and I guess I just stood there for about 30 minutes and until another lady noticed me and she actually uh, offered her seat to me. Over the course of a week, people gave Yan Jiao a seat three times out of four. So what do you think about these results? Are they better than expected? It's clearly better than, than how this worked before, where you know, there was basically no response and now there seems to be something going on. With these kinds of interventions, we shouldn't expect perfection. So as long as we manage to change some people's minds, I think this is still a successful intervention. The science behind persuasion is fascinating. And the research suggests that although techniques don't work all the time, they work most of the time. And you know what? I'll take those odds, especially when I'm trying to persuade my production manager to give me a raise.